Hello, everyone. Lovely to see you on this, the latest Foresight Lecture brought to you by the Worldwide Alpha Group. Before I introduce today's wonderful speaker, let me give you a brief two-minute overview of the Alpha Group. The Alpha Group has been established for nine years. It is a peer-to-peer -peer executive board. It is established in 31 countries and it works with business owners all over the world. They meet once a month around a boardroom table. An alpha group is limited to maximum 20 members. So no matter how big the city, Istanbul, Bangkok, Washington, only 20 members are ever allowed to join. So very exclusive and no two members in the same industry. So very exclusive very limited, and we make one promise and one promise only. And that is that we will double the value of their business in two to three years. And so far, we have never failed. I'm joined by the International Managing Director of the Alpha Group, Colin Lindsay. So he's here to make sure I, I'm on my best behavior and I do things correctly. Good afternoon, good, everybody. Good afternoon, Colin. Lovely to have you. Let me introduce today's speaker and today's topic. Today's speaker is both a friend, a colleague, a coach, master coach, and the owner of one of the most prestigious coach training schools in the United Kingdom. And it's my pleasure to introduce Ian Jeffress. And Ian is going to talk today about preparing the future generation. And to put that in a little bit of background, Ian, for the last two or three years, has been working exclusively with top industry experts in the UK and worldwide in the school industry, the education industry, uh, relevant parts of government, and has put together a unique and world-breaking what is called Child and Adolescent Coach Training Programme which launched a, a year or two ago uh, and is, has now spread all over the world, teaching men and women how to work with children, with adolescents, how to coach them, how to help them, how to help them to build, grow, expand, develop and create. So it is with great, great pleasure that I introduce Ian. If you do have a question, either put your hand up and ask it verbally or type it into the chat box below and we will deal with it. Ian, over to you, my friend. Gerald, thank you so much indeed. And um, <clears throat> I hope I won't, uh, uh, I'll hope I'll live up to, uh, to the, uh, to the build-up that you've just given me. Um, just a few other things. Uh, I've known Gerald since 2003 when he first walked into my print shop and so the rest, as they say, is history. Um, I've had several careers, and I'll come on to that later. But as part of the introduction to this, uh, I just want to say a few things. And one is that uh, if I use pronouns like his or her, they are interchangeable, and they can mean anything that you would like them to mean in your own setting. You may hear some fake news. Fake news is all the um, is all the rage, and it's very difficult sometimes to identify the difference between fake news and real news. And this will, I'll come on to a little bit later under the heading of communication. I'm going to make generalizations. I'm going to use hearsay. I'm going to make some very general comments, uh, and there is a reason for this, and that is that. Uh, I want to encourage thought. I'm going to try and be as accurate as I can be. But I cannot back up a lot of what I say because there is little research. There's little or even no research. And certainly evaluative research in what we're doing. It is effectively so new. I'd just like to um, go back on what Gerard said, that actually we've been working on this program now for over six years. And the main driver behind this is not actually me. It's a lady by the name of Raquel Leonello, who is the author 
uh, or the lead author of a program called The Other Subject, which I'll be talking about later. So it's been going on for quite some time and then COVID got in the way and everything came to a halt. But we're hoping now to make further progress. What I say will be based on UK situations, on the United Kingdom situations and information derived effectively from the United Kingdom. Uh, the reason for that is that I have little knowledge of what goes on around the world. I have some, but only a little. Uh, I'm far more attuned to what is happening in my location. I hope that you will be able to translate what I say, should you need to, into the organizations that uh, that you run in your parts of the world. I will not be using statistics. Now, <clears throat> statistics is my is, is, is one of those things that I just do not enjoy. It's lovely. There's lots of them about. Um, but I agree with uh, Benjamin Disraeli, who in 1895 said there are lies, damned lies and statistics. Now, whether he actually coined the phrase or not is a matter of conjecture. It's apparently he didn't. It's been around since 1891. And I thank the York, uh, Math, York University Maths Department for that information. They can't actually pin down who, who initially said it. But the judiciary also used there are liars, damned liars. Um, and what's the other one? Oh, and, uh, and expert witnesses. So there you go. There's things on that. So therefore, I will not be using statistics. And I'm going to give you a little example of why not. About two months ago, there was a report written which stated that one in four students in the United Kingdom felt unsafe at school. Now, that's quite damning. Uh, so I thought I'd better look into this a bit further. And they took as a population for their study 70,000 pupils. Well, actually, that's pretty good. I like that. They asked them five questions. And basically, it was on a, or they asked them one question, and it was basically gave them a sliding scale of very safe. Yeah, really safe. Mm, quite safe. And then not really safe and no, I don't like it at all. And what they'd done is that that middle bracket, that fairly safe bracket, they had lumped with the um, unsafe side and to produce these figures of one in four, uh, ostensibly to get more money for the uh, safety in schools. Now, if that middle bracket was put in the positive side and the safety side, the answer would then be one in 10 would feel unsafe. And actually, that's not bad at all. But one of the things that did come out of the report and wasn't mentioned in the um, in, in, in the journalistic comment was that the difference between they, the children feeling safe at school and feeling safe outside school was only 2%. So realistically, the schools are doing a pretty good job. And so that's the reason why I will not be using statistics. Now, I have to ask you all individually, uh, you don't have to answer, but you can think about it, why are you here? Do you have a business and you are thinking about where the next um, staff are going to come from? Are you uh, recruiting straight from uh, the teenage market, the, uh, the, early, um, the early adult market or further? If the former, if the teenage market, if the early adult market, then that's fine because that's what we're here for. You may be parents. You may be parents and business owners. You may be involved in education. You may just be here out of general interest. Hopefully, I'll have something for all of you. My objective during this talk is to make you aware of the situation of the up and coming generation in preparation for business. <clears throat> As I say, you may already be aware, but let's discuss that. I plan to enthuse you on this subject because actually it affects us all as adults. I want to sow the seed for ongoing thought and perhaps discussion. And I can offer you a money back guarantee. What you paid to attend today, I will give you back if you don't enjoy it. 
Now I'm on a safe bet there because I know full well that you're healed here for free. So that's good. So about me. Well, in the United Kingdom, there is currently uh, an advertisement going on for people to join the Royal Navy. And I have indeed been part of the Royal Navy. I was there for 25 years. So I was born in Cornwall and made in the Royal Navy. Now, I like that because it brings it will bring me on to something a little later. I've been a high street retailer. I had two high street retail shops. One was a printing business, which I've mentioned before, and the other one was selling school uniform. And that brought me into uh, in touch with schools, with teenagers, with children, with parents, because I was selling something for organizations which people didn't want to buy for people who didn't want to wear. Now, that's quite an interesting business model. I have a Bachelor's of Science. I have a Master of Arts. But the most important thing to me is I am an accredited coach. And that is my third career. And that is the bit that I really enjoy. I really enjoy helping people. I particularly enjoy helping teenagers. Because very often you can find a problem that the teenager is suffering and take them from where they are to where they want to be. And that may be passing their exams. It may be a social problem. It may be anything like that. But the benefit is that if they come to coaching, they're normally actually quite receptive and they're ready to make that change. Wish that all adults were like that too. So where are we in the world? What's our situation? Well, in the long term, we're in the throes of a digital industrial revolution. And that comes with consequent social change. Now, we've been through these revolutions before. We've been through the industrial industrial revolution. We've been through the Bronze Age. Somebody invented the wheel. You know, all of these revolutions, sorry about the pun, all of these revolutions have been got through. And there's no reason why we won't get through the digital industrial revolution. But it also means that there's an awful lot going on. And in 1992, when I was undertaking my master's, I coined the phrase that change is the steady state. It's only the rate that changes. And things get faster and faster and faster. And we don't know when they're going to slow down. That can be quite a problem. Now, other people may have coined that, that phrase as well. So I'm not going to um, die in a ditch if you've heard it before. Now, in the short term, we've had to suffer with COVID-19. And in the United Kingdom, we realized after we'd locked everybody down and stopped schools and things like that, that the teens particularly, and also the younger children, gained so much social um, growth that when they were cut off from it, it's a big problem. And I think that that thing has actually just come home to roost now and ha well, has done over the past year. I mean, yeah, we're recovering, but there are a tremendous number of people who have fallen back in their social advance. And actually that has manifested itself um, uh, quite apparently. The Ukraine war is very, very close to a lot of people, particularly in Europe and particularly to people either in Ukraine or neighboring countries, like, for instance, example, uh, Moldova. It's much closer to our thoughts than perhaps the, uh, the conflicts, the wars that we've um, been involved in in the Middle East, uh, and the Balkans and various other parts, but this one really hits home and it's unstable, it's destabilizing, it's unsettling. So we are actually more aware. Now, what are the, um, what are the problems? Well, I speak with a lot of employers and I frequently hear the same remark that the new workforce is not ready for work. And it's causing them a problem. 
And I'm talking about the, the young work, workforce. The older workforce, they're more attuned to working, they understand it and things like that. It's not a problem. But the new workforce does not appear to be ready for work. So I ask the questions further, and it's about lack of resilience, lack of tolerance, lack of commitment, lack of concentration, reduced attention span, and arguably the most important thing, lack of the ability to communicate. Yeah, we can all speak, most of us can write, but the lack of the ability to communicate sensibly with our teams, with our peers, with our bosses, and things like that. It's almost got too fast. There's so much information out there now that this perhaps is causing one of the problems. Communication is all but instantaneous. We all have uh, smartphones. We're most of us involved in social media. And information is pouring at us from all angles. We're spouting out communication as fast as we can. And sometimes we don't give it enough thought. Not only do we not give it enough thought, but the recipients don't have time to give the message enough thought as to exactly what it means. And so it's like playing Chinese whispers, that the, that the initiator of the communication has not stated what they really wanted to state. And I'm talking about the written word here. The receiver of that communication has misunderstood because they're in um, a totally different mindset. They may not be thinking clearly. There may be too much going on elsewhere. They, they just see the problem. And that has caused a tremendous amount of uh, social unrest, particularly in schools and places like that. And that continues on with these people through their, their adolescent lives as they become adults and I would go so far as to say is there's a whole generation of young adults who do not necessarily communicate particularly well. And this affects their adulthood, it affects their work, their work life, and it affects the next generation. So we've got a big problem. Now, it's very much a generalization. There are people there who can communicate perfectly effectively, and those are the people, of course, who we want in our businesses. But it is a problem, nevertheless. Perhaps also these people are very much more of the what's in it for me brigade, the WIFMs. Now, using, using the WIFM uh, phrase, yeah, people want to know what's in it for them, and quite rightly so. But because there's so much information out there now, it's easy to see green grass elsewhere than where you are. It's easy to move. The mobility between jobs is so much easier these days than perhaps it was. There's so much more information on social media. And, you know, for example, LinkedIn is absolutely teeming with people. And how many people actually use LinkedIn? Well, how many people are on LinkedIn and how many people use LinkedIn? Perhaps the two different questions. And now we're getting LinkedIn influencers. And is everything they say true? Or is it fake news? Without the time to look further into it, we're not going to know. We're going to have to guess. So perhaps in summary of this problem, we could say that there's a lack of core life skills in the formative years of the next generation or perhaps in the current generation of young adults. I'd just like to take a couple of minutes for you to all consider five traits that you would like to see in a next generation worker if they should they be starting work for you. Just give that one some thought. Five traits in your next employees as they come out of school, college, university. I always post them on the chat if you'd like.
Thank you, Elizabeth. Being able to communicate. Absolutely. Thank you, Nadeja. Nadeja, sorry. Thank you, Nadia. Much easier. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let's have a look at the second situation. Thank you, Michelle. Whose responsibility is it? Whose responsibility is it to prepare these people for the workplace? The education system doesn't want to, at least not in the United Kingdom. They want to avoid that. They are very much tied up with academics. In fact, I understood from last week discussing with a, uh, a parent I know who said that the application system now for the uh, the, the bigger, the, the, the top grade universities in the United Kingdom is not interested in the personal statement. He wants to know how much the applicant has read into the course they want to do, how many books they've read about economics, so if that is what they want. Much more about the academics involved. How much academics have you done? They're not so interested in what they've done outside of school, whether they've been in the combined cadet force, whether they've done some outward bounding and things like that. You know, they're much more interested now in academics. That worries me. Parents, is it the parents' responsibility? Now, some would say, yes, it is. I think in the past, it's always been the parents' responsibility. But do the parents have time? Are they too busy living, surviving, looking after their family? Do they actually have the knowledge? Because they're, in, they're young adults and they're progressing further forward. They may not have even had a chance to look at their own core life skills. Is it that there's a breakdown in the cohesive family unit? So there are so many more single parents there who can't share the load with their partner. I promise I wasn't going to use statistics, but there are various comments that there are far many, far more divorces these days. But perhaps that's, they think that's tailing off. The trouble is, in order to get divorced, you have to be married in the first place. How many marriages are there? And so therefore, how many partnerships break up? We don't know. Or could it be life in general? Could it be the media? So much news out there. So much news biased towards what the newscasters want to, want to tell you. In, paper, in newspapers, if you really look at it, a, news, a newspaper journalist's job is not to sell you the news. It's to provide the news in a way that sells the advertising space. Now, that might be cynical. I don't think so. Is it that there's just too much on social media, that the youngsters just cannot cope? They don't have time to think. So whose responsibility is it to resolve all this? Is it the companies themselves? In the 1950s, there were a book came out about the Royal Navy, about the um, joining the Royal Navy. It was uh, by a chap by the name of John Winton. It was what I would call factional. There was a little bit of fact in it, but there was a lot of fiction. And one of the phrases that stuck in my mind, because I had to go through the Admiralty Interview Board in order to become uh, an officer, was that the Admiral called his board together at the beginning and said, gentlemen, I don't need to remind you that what the Navy is looking for is half wits. And he then qualified that by saying, we will add the other half in, the, in our own time and in our own way. And actually, that's very true. 
So when I said I was born in Cornwall and made in the Royal Navy, that's effectively what they did. They took me in aged 18, 19. They broke me, they broke me down into little pieces and rebuilt me the way they wanted me. They left a few bits of me in, but hey, there we go. Because that's what they were after. But this is a long-term career path. So with career paths these days, um, and the workers jumping from job to job to job, is it the responsibility of their first job to start knocking them into workplace shape? Or should that already be done? Is it the universities and colleges who should be responsible for this? And in part, they do a little, but I've already said how the application system is taking away the focus on anything but academics. And so consequently, it would appear that the universities are concentrating on academe, which is fine for them because they want people to learn what they are producing and therefore going to research things like that. But are they going in ready into the workplace? Pricewaterhouse Cooper has been heard to uh, has, has been uh, identified as mentioning that no longer will they be recruiting directly from Oxford and Cambridge universities, which is interesting because Pricewaterhouse Cooper are going the other way. They're going away from the academics and wanting people who have leadership, who have communication skills, who can work as a team who are people who have something else to give apart from the brain power. And that doesn't equate if you look at what the universities appear to be doing. Is it the family's job to resolve it? How can we help the families resolve these, these situations? Well, we can. Is it the schools? Let's go back even further. Let's build these children up from the age of four all the way through their school life until they leave age 16 or 18. But schools at the moment, I think of education as a three-legged stool, balanced precariously on one leg. That leg is academe. It's all about academics. There are two stumps which makes the stool unstable because they don't reach the ground. Those are preparation for adulthood and preparation for work. Now, in my mind, that would make a nice, stable education system. So what can we offer schools? What can we offer parents? What can we offer businesses? Well, Gerard mentioned what we've been doing for the last, as I said, six years, which is developing an adolescent and child coaching training program, where we train people to become adolescent and child coaches. And the core element of this is uh, a thing called the other subject, arguably the, the, the subject that dare not speak its name. It is not a core curriculum subject. It could fit in the um, what's known in the UK as PHSE, which is physical, um, sorry, psychological health uh, and social education. And perhaps that's the best place for it. Because the other subject, realistically, is a core life skills program. And it's been developed by the School Wellbeing Alliance with whom we work. And it's used in support of our adolescent and child coaching program. Now, my job within this uh, effectively is sort of the administration and the development of it. I'm not the expert who has produced this, this program. As I said, that was Rio Keller Leonello. But it's also designed for coaches to use in a one-to-one -one situation. It can be as effective and just as effective used in schools, in classes, provided it's done in a non-judgmental and adviceless way. It's non-assessed. So it gives the students something to think, I don't have to worry about this because there is no exam. There's part one of one of the uh, one of the tools involved is actually called exam busters, and it helps them to understand how to get through exams. There's another one on sleep. There's plenty on other things, and so therefore it's very useful uh, for schools, for colleges, for parents as well, because 
if they understand the core life skills programs and here they can help their children go through it, not necessarily sitting them down and going through, going through it page by page, but understanding what it's about and perhaps going back to the books if necessary, or the PowerPoints in this case, or the PDFs, then it's great. And it can be done at all ages. Now, the subjects covered are resilience, communication, relationship with self, relationship with others, which I'm going to call social relationships, accomplishment, performance, focus and awareness. And the other subject deals with that in an age-appropriate way. So every year they can go through those subjects and grow and develop those core life skills, also soft skills, which are going to help them not only as they grow and develop, but will help them later in life as well. And that's what it's all about. So realistically, I suppose, we could look at this as communication and self-communication. Speaking with yourself, understanding yourself. But it's also leadership and self-leadership. We are all leaders in one form or another. Most of us will lead a team. Most of us will lead at least one other individual. As parents, we lead our children. But we all lead ourselves. And so, therefore, leadership skills are quite important. Now, there's books and books and books written all about leadership. And I'm not going to go into the 40, 45, 5, 10, however many leadership qualities there are out there. Because there are a lot. But that doesn't matter. But being able to have those leadership qualities that are built and developed through the core life skills is really, really important. And it prepares students for adulthood and for the workplace. Okay, last five, ten minutes. There's another problem. If we want to get these into school, which we do, in the UK, uh, the school organisations have little or no budget at the moment for any training which is not currently required for core curriculum work, for the work that they are going to be assessed on, for the work that students are going to be assessed on. Uh, and that's not good. Now, some of the real, really bright um, go-getting organisations, head teachers and things like that, identify that actually if they spend some money now their student force will improve and so will their staff so spend to save perhaps less staff sickness due to stress better results for the students more empowered students ready to go forward less disciplinary problems also sounds good doesn't it until you get to the next bit, which is school organisations have little or no time outside of the requirements for filling the core curriculum functions. They are so busy chasing their own tails that they haven't got time to think about what goes in or what could be substituted in order to do this. Uh, this has been made even more apparent when you th think that so two years was spoilt by COVID-19. And the next year was involved in trying to recover from COVID-19, which mostly meant the schools couldn't hardly think from one day to the next, let alone from one term to the next or one year to the next. So in general, schools do not cater for the soft skills needed for the workplace. But some individual school staff do understand this need. So every teacher I talk to apart from one, actually, every teacher I talk to will say, yeah, we understand this. But you get two types of teachers here. You get teachers who only want to teach their subject. And you get others who want to train the students to the best of their ability. And both have a place. So what can we do about it? Well, by addressing the budgetary aspects, perhaps, and offer free training and support, 
we would love to think that the organisations can then work to find time to provide such core life skills training for the students as they can. Once they really understand what this is about, then perhaps they see through the forest, perhaps they see the wood for the trees, and therefore they can say, right, now we understand, now we can move things around in order to cater for this. So perhaps by addressing the budgetary aspects, we can undo the logjam. And by the way, this program realistically takes no more than eight hours per year which is not much, eight one-hour lessons, 16 half-hour lessons. I mean, it could take more, it can be expanded, but eight hours a year is all that is required. So, my new company is Young Minds Coaching. It is a, um, it is a community interest company, and by that I mean it's not for profit. We have gone down this line. My company used to be called IMJ Limited. <laughs> My initials, funny old thing. Um, but Young Minds Coaching actually does exactly what it says on the tin. Not only do I coach Young Minds, but we also train coaches to make brighter futures. And anybody can call themselves a coach. So teachers can become coaches. Doesn't mean to say they have to be professional coaches, but they can become coaches. And through this, we believe that we can help here. So we're looking for companies who support a corporate social responsibility um, plan. Now, this is also known as corporate citizenship. Uh, whether they're required to or not, I mean, some big companies are required to provide a CSR uh, plan, and they do. Other companies don't. But actually, perhaps they might like to. And how could they do that? Well, a number of options. They can either work themselves, they can go into schools, they can explain what um, what what work what work um, qualities they're looking for. They can talk to students and things like that. Great, magic. Or they could sponsor a school and college, either locally or nationally, to be able to run a program such as ours. Other programs are available, but this one is unique in its way of Pre pre um, presenting the information and providing the other subject. Because if um, they can't uh, go as far as sponsoring a school or a college, then perhaps just a teacher. And so therefore there is a teacher in the school or another school staff member, doesn't have to be a teacher, who wants to learn more, who wants to support, who can run these, um, these classes within the school. Wouldn't it be wonderful if I could find somebody who sponsored the entire program? Now, that would be magic. As I say, we're a not-for-profit organization. But also, we're looking for people to support an evaluative research program. Now, lots and lots has been written on the benefits of supporting adolescents, children, and things like that. And the, the, uh, the, the adolescent mind, which is a total mush. But there is very little research being done because it hasn't been rolled out in the schools such that we can look at how beneficial it is over six months, over one year, over two years, over three years. But a PhD uh, doctorate on those lines would be wonderful to be able to fund in order that we can actually get this underway. Well, I'm just about at the um, peak of the... Um, Minute 45, which is what I was aiming for, which allow 15 minutes for questions. And so I'd just like to summarize that this doesn't affect everybody leaving school. Lots of people have those social skills. They may have been almost born with those social skills and communication, sorry, the core life skills. They may have been born with them. They may have had them developed, but there are a significant number that we're going to have to force into learning about them. So in the same way that there are le great leaders, there are born leaders, there are leaders that aspire to greatness, and there are leaders who have greatness thrust upon them. You could actually say the same about the um, 
uh, these uh, these core life skills. Some appear to be born with these core life skills. Some just absorb them as they go through life, which is absolutely great. Others need to be taught. They need to be helped. And I passionately believe that going by giving this problem to the schools, they can resolve that. And the schools will benefit themselves because they will have a better quality of life within the school because the students will have these core life skills growing and developing and communication 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 is the key to almost every situation as i've said it is so easy these days to look at a uh, a quick text and then think oh it's the end of my life but actually it didn't mean that at all it was meant in a totally different context and you have taken it totally out of context rather than stopping thinking, what does this really mean? But that's a skill in itself to stop and think before acting. So there we go. Hopefully I have enthused you. Hopefully I've given you something to think about. Hopefully I have informed you. And this program can also be run within, you know, for adults within a business. Not a problem. So hopefully you've also got the three takeaways there. Anyway, time for questions. Thank you very Colette, much. Thank you very much indeed. Sorry. Thank you. I've made copious oh, notes here on my pad. Um, hi, everyone. If you have any questions for Ian, either type them in the chat box or unmute yourself and please feel free to ask. This is a, a golden opportunity while we have Ian here handcuffed to the desk to uh, to get him to answer. I have I have a question for Ian. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this outstanding presentation. Um, did you made any relationships between uh, you know, families or communities that have less money and those or the children that have access to parents maybe that are more wealthy. Because when we look at the literacy, literacy skills study that's been done years ago, there's there's a link there. I have looked at this. Um, yes, there is a link, but actually I would suggest that the situation is greater than just the um, the wealth. Uh, I do understand that there are there are some uh, places where uh, those who are um, who are struggling financially don't have the uh, the opportunities. Um, but actually, a lot of them, seem to do very well in providing those core life skills. I would put it down to where parents don't have the time. Now that goes across social boundaries, um, depending on why they don't have time. It could be that they're too busy running their family. It could be that they're too busy um, just trying to uh, make money. And there are families who's, who think that they've just got to keep on making money. They're in the rat race. And the the, uh, the hamster wheel goes round and round and round. And they forget, perhaps, um, some of them don't even remember, that they have children who need to grow up. They think that other people are going to give those children that information. Uh, yet they're not applying it themselves. There are others who delegate that responsibility to others. And so the children don't actually get as much parental time as perhaps they would like. And this causes another social divide. So, as I said, I'm talking in generalizations here, but I think um, you, you bring up a very valid point. But it's more than that. It's effective. The, the problem is across 
the whole social spectrum in one form or another. Thank you, Michael, for that question. Do we have any other questions for Ian? Jockey. There is yes, some I, in the chat. Yeah. Jockey, yes, I can give you the name of the the, the, the the book is called We Joined the Navy. And the author is John Winton. And it's quite a tongue in cheek book. It's great fun to read. Uh, whether you can still find a copy of it, I don't know. But um, you look around. There are there are some around, but it's uh, very much some second hand bookshop type of stuff. Uh, for those of you that would like to contact Ian directly, I have just put his name and email into the chat. So you can copy that and save it. And I'm sure Ian would be very happy to receive uh, direct emails from you with any question uh, on a related subject. Uh, I'll give you all a minute to, to copy that email address. Uh, any other final questions for Ian? No, we have recorded. I, can, can I have can I have one more? Of course, of course, Mikael, of course. Okay. So it's interesting what you mentioned. You know, it's it's a cross thing, um, a, a, a across the m many things, but people who are coming from an unwealthy uh, environment could probably be in a better situation to develop these core skills that you mentioned, soft or hardcore skills. Because, you know, they have to develop their resilience. You know, they have more adversity in their life. Absolutely. I fully agree with you there. That's, uh, you know, that, 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 that is a very good point, that they uh, maybe are not so burdened with the, uh, with the requirements of academe uh, there are many cultures in the world who, whose uh, the parents will focus the children in a particular direction. <clears throat> um, there are some who say, "You will be a doctor. You will be an engineer," um, and the children grow up having to cope with that pressure of becoming doctors and engineers. Uh, which leaves very little time left to develop the perhaps the social skills. Um, and as I said, you know, if if universities are actually just looking for uh, academic and academic requirements, which is seen by some as a uh, as the next step towards uh, towards uh, your career, then it means that they're going to come out of university fairly narrow within the scope of their lives they may be brilliant ac academics and there is a place for brilliant academics don't get me wrong but the majority of people need to have um not the academic brilliance but actually far more in the sort of social side now in the united kingdom i'm just going to go on from that um there are now many organizations uh many of the large organizations especially who un who will provide what are known as degree apprenticeships so an apprenticeship is not now just a vocational um way of training it's a way that people can join a company and get a degree training with that company and in fact it was uh, tony blair's son ewan who has uh, who runs a company which accredits such degrees, which is actually quite interesting. And I'm I'm in two minds. I've got two teenagers. One desperately wants to go to university because she wants the university life. The other one, I'm not so sure. I think that perhaps that um, he will look into uh, the second type of of, uh, of degree achievement, of actually going into business and getting his degree through there. I'm not saying that everybody needs a degree, far from it. There are people out there who don't need degrees. There are people who've risen to extraordinarily high prices without degrees. I'm um, thinking of Richard Branson for one. You know, and he had, he had, he had great core life skills. <laughs> 
and he still does. And the reason why is because he was disadvantaged at school. He was dyslexic. And he rose above that through having effectively gained these life skills through one way or another, but they certainly won't have been uh, formally taught. Thank you, Mick. Oh, by the way, by the way, one final thing. I would like to tell everybody that I own an E-Type Jaguar. An E-Type Jaguar? An E-Type Jaguar. Okay. It's fake news. <laughs> ah, you do own My an E-Type e Jaguar. A 1 in 87 model of an E-Type Jaguar. Yes. Oh, well, you don't have to. <laughs> Listen, thank Which... you, Ian. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank all the rest of you for giving your time today. Uh, we have recorded it. It will appear on the Foresight website within a couple of days, and it will be there for you to share with anyone you want or revisit. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it.